Good morning, everybody, and a big, big warm welcome to you all to day three of a Sky Day 2021 conference. Now, for those of you who may not have met me virtually, if you're just joining us, I'm Karen Coleman. I'm a broadcaster and journalist, and I'm facilitating this conference. And indeed, I have the pleasure of moderating this next session because it's time now for the launch of the 2021 European Antibiotic Awareness Day. And European Antibiotic Awareness Day, we'll call it EAAD from now on, is a European health initiative coordinated by the ECDC in partnership with World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. It takes place every year during the week of the 18th to the 24th of November. And EAAD provides a platform for and supports two national campaigns on prudent use of antibiotics. Over 43 countries have run campaigns since it started in 2008. Now, the theme of this year's EAAD is in times of COVID-19, don't forget about antimicrobial resistance. Stay united to preserve antimicrobials. So today, besides this session, there will also be the launch of the digital EAAD campaign that includes enhanced collaborations with social media influencers in each EU EEA country. The digital campaign also includes video statements from high level speakers from the EU and experts from EU EEA countries. There is also an interactive tool on the EAAD website, I think I put an extra A in there, featuring national resources on AMR EAAD partners, influencers, along with the ECDC's own resources. And to take part in the campaign and or to find resources, please visit the EAAD profiles on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, its own web page. And the hashtags are predictably hashtag EAAD. Then there's hashtag antibiotic resistance, hashtag antibiotics, and hashtag keep antibiotics working. So I'm sure one of those will work for you. Now, I'll just give you a brief rundown on the format of this session. So we're going to begin first with individual interventions from three keynote speakers, and then we will have a moderated scientific panel discussion, which will address the theme of this year's EAAD event. And again, a reminder of that, it is in times of COVID-19, don't forget about antimicrobial resistance stay united to preserve antimicrobials. So I'm going to introduce our keynote speakers one by one, and then I will invite our panelists to join us once each one of those has spoken. So our first keynote speaker is Sandra Galina, the European Commission's Director General for Health and Food Safety. Sandra is now going to deliver her message through the following video. Hello. It is my pleasure to open this year's annual online event organized by ECDC for the European Antibiotic Awareness Day. Over the past few years, let me say the last two, we have witnessed how a single virus, COVID-19, can upend our lives if we have no means to counteract it. We cannot reach a stage where this happens with all other microbes. COVID-19 has taught us many lessons. It has reminded us of how interdependent human health, animal health and the environment are. I would also add that the pandemic has made it crystal clear how destabilizing cross-border health threats are. It is also important to remember that decisive coordinated action and collaboration when we are confronted with a global health threat are vital. So, in a summary, acting alone simply has never and will never work. This is why it is striking to note that while COVID-19 pandemic has dominated uh, news feeds for almost two years now, Another growing pandemic threatening our societies is there and, uh, you know, has been sort of largely silent. It is the antimicrobic resistance. It is one of our time's major public health threats. 
The ECDC's latest surveillance report and the conclusions will be presented by Andrea later today. Um, the report shows, I was saying, for instance, that more than half of the Escherichia coli samples now show resistance. This sort of silent tsunami, as uh, some have said, is slowly gathering pace and we must urgently act to reverse it. Now, the EU response to the COVID-19 crisis has strengthened our health security framework through further cross-border coordination and has boosted the mandates of ECDC, for instance, but also EMA. It has also launched HERA. This improved surveillance uh, and preparedness will be important for the fight against AMR, for sure. Now, the Health and Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA, as we call it, is an important component for a strong European health union. Now, HERA will respond to important gaps that are identified in the EU's security framework. So it will serve to improve the union's development, manufacturing, procurement and distribution of key medical countermeasures. So we should be better off than you know we were in the past. HERA, if I can say, will focus on serious cross-border health threats. Uh, so this includes AMR. It should anticipate major threats through strategic stockpiling of antimicrobials, for instance. Uh, I would also like to add that the pharma strategy, as I call it, the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe in the real title, makes AMR a priority. Uh, it includes, uh, I would say, the issue of bringing new antimicrobials on the market through incentives for, for drug developers. At the very core of the pharma strategy, we have an idea which is one of let me say, curbing the excessive and unjustified, I would say, inappropriate use of existing antimicrobials through measures to restrict and optimize the use of antimicrobial medicines. Now, this work, as you know, is backed by the EU for Health, so we are putting the money where we believe it should be, and we are funding several AMR-related actions this year and for the next uh, seven years. Uh, we have already taken some important steps and I would like to mention the veterinary medicines. Um, here our policies are paying off. I would like to say that over the last 10 years, the sales of veterinary um, antimicrobials in Europe have dropped considerably by more than a third, if we want to be precise, and they have contributed to the fight against AMR in a very meaningful way. This is a major accomplishment for the veterinary sector, but it should not be, I would say, seen as only a veterinary achievement. We must continue to strive to reach the objective that is set in the farm to fork strategy, where we say that by 2030, we need to reduce by 50% the overall EU sales of antimicrobials for farmed animals and also animals in aquaculture. So to this end, I would say that I cannot but mention the effective implementation of the, of the regulations, which should start in January next year uh, and will be again instrumental in achieving this objective. The regulation provides for a wide range of uh, very specific measures to promote a more prudent and responsible use of antimicrobials in animals. Now, despite the delays and the heated debate, you may have followed it recently in the European Parliament, I would like to say that I'm very happy to say that the delegated regulation establishing the criteria for the selection of those antimicrobials has now been published. I'm very proud about this. The adoption of the text is in fact a major step and uh, uh, it provides a very solid basis to select those antimicrobials that will be reserved for human medicine. Uh, and this is in keeping with the One Health approach. I count on the ECDC support for this selection. 
The actions are a clear indication that, you know, the European Union is committed to drive further changes. Uh, we would like to present towards the end of 2022 new policy initiatives to boost our efforts to tackle AMR, harnessing, I would say, uh, additional instruments that have come into play since the adoption of our action plan. The new policy initiatives will be based on a thorough assessment of the ongoing 2017 action plan, which will be also discussed in the One Health Network towards the end of January for those who are interested. So, as I was saying to all of you, uh, these past two years have reminded us of the dangers posed by a virus. Uh, let me say, the dangers to us and to our way of life are similar or much worse when we ignore the threats that antimicrobial resistance can pose on this and I would say for the future generations also. Today, uh, I would say that on the occasion of the Antimicrobial Awareness Day, I reaffirm my personal and the Commission's unwavering commitment to avert the next silent pandemic of antimicrobial resistance. I wish you a very fruitful meeting today and I thank you for the attention you have given me. Best of luck. Sandra Galina there, the European Commission's Director General for Health and Food Safety. Now, our next guest is, of course, no stranger, I'm sure, to most of you. Andrea Amon is the Director of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, the ECDC. And rather than giving an address, Andrea is going to engage in a question and answer session with me. Andrea, you are very, very welcome to your own conference. You're joining me from your studios in Stockholm. So I suppose, again, this is a, a big day today. The ECDC is releasing its 2020 update on antibiotic um, consumption in Europe. What do the latest data show? Yeah, Karen, good morning, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, so the antibiotic consumption data showed us from um, 2015 to 2019 a decrease uh, in uh, the total consumption of antibiotics uh, in humans. And uh, this, of course, varied uh, depending on, on the country. Now, if you're looking at the last year uh, from 2019 to 2020, we see a further decrease by 15 percent. And uh, this is most likely a result uh, of uh, the COVID pandemic. Now, we need to analyze this, uh, of course, further, but it's definitely good news. Very good news. You mentioned that. One of the reasons you think is most likely to do with the COVID pandemic, I suppose that's not necessarily a surprise, but what other reasons are behind the, decrease, the decreases? Well, as I said, we need to further analyze and uh, for for now, uh, we can only um, um, well uh, assume that uh, the, the measures, for instance, that were in uh, implemented in the connection with the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, have uh, uh, contributed to this decrease. You know, the non-pharmaceutical measures like physical distancing, um, uh, the respiratory etiquette, wearing a face mask and the promotion of hand hygiene. Um, uh, it, it also could be that um, uh, the uh, health healthcare seeking behavior changed and the prescription behavior. Um, we have seen uh, also a large decrease in um, uh, antibiotics uh, in the community for those that are usually um, used to treat uh, respiratory tract infections and uh, for instance penicillin and that is in line with the uh, observed uh, lower incidence of respiratory tract infection that we have seen uh, since uh, 2000. 
um, and um, the it could also be that uh, people uh, were uh, less likely to go to uh, uh, their their uh, GP uh, for for mild or self limiting diseases because they didn't want to uh, get exposed uh, or because they didn't get an appointment. So uh, there might really be uh, a variety of factors related to the pandemic that have uh, contributed to that. OK, now we know that the more a country consumes antibiotics, the higher the resistance percentages in the country. And since antibiotic consumption then decreased in 2020, do you think we will see then an effect on antimicrobial resistance? So we also uh, just published our latest data of uh, the AMR surveillance and we did not observe uh, an immediate effect uh, in the in the um, uh, 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 data on on AMR. So we need to continue to monitor uh, the the uh, AMR data, uh, but it's uh, probably too early to give an answer to your question. Because um, what we're seeing in the AMR data is uh, that it's still a serious challenge uh, in the EU uh, to, um, uh, in particular, when we look at um, uh, specific bacterial uh, species antimicrobial group uh, uh, combinations. Uh, so we have to keep up our efforts and uh, also continue the One Health approach uh, in order to uh, maybe uh, see further down the line, um, preferably sooner than later, a reduction in antimicrobial resistance. What we are seeing is that uh, uh, almost half of uh, the isolates uh, of Escherichia coli in, uh, uh, that are reported to ECDC and almost a third of the Klebsiella pneumoniae uh, isolate that are reported uh, uh, are resistant to at least one uh, antimicrobial and combined resistant to more than one is uh, actually very very frequent. And uh, we also see an increasing trend uh, in the percentage of vancomycin resistant isolates of efacium uh, in the EU, which increased uh, from 11.6% in 2016 to 16.8% uh, in 2020. And uh, there is what we saw already in the past year, still this north, south, west, east gradient, meaning that uh, the highest proportions or percentages of antimicrobial resistance are reported uh, in the southeast of Europe and the lowest in the north. OK, very interesting. And why are those bacteria species antimicrobial group combinations important? They um, are particularly important because uh, vancomycin and the carbapenems um, uh, are um, antibiotics, which we call last line, because uh, if we have resistance against those, there is not much treatment option left. Um, and that, of course, um, is a, um, uh, 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 a danger uh, to um, uh, the, the patients infected with uh, these um, in, uh, because uh, these um, limited treatment options that are left are not working in every case and uh, leading to uh, uh, potential fatal outcomes. It uh, also compromises the effectiveness of medical intervention interventions like transplantations or, or uh, cancer treatments. Uh, so the, uh, when we, for instance, uh, uh, take uh, the already mentioned uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae, uh, if we have in uh, uh, multi-drug uh, uh, resistance in these bacteria combined with a resistance to carbapenems, then there is very little that you can do for these patients um, and, uh, anymore. And also for the uh, vancomycin resistance efacium, uh, that is really a challenge and they are difficult uh, to treat. They have been listed, the VRE, the vancomycin resistant um, uh, efacium, 
magnesium have been listed by WHO also as a high priority in its global priority list of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, which emphasizes the and acknowledges the paucity of treatment options um, uh, that uh, exist. Okay, very interesting. So then what are, do you think, the main strategies then to address AMR? Well, we have identified three strategies. They are not new. We are um, already um, quoting them for several years uh, and they're also not very difficult. So the first one is that we all use antibiotics prudently. What does this mean? It's that we use them only if, it, if they're needed in the correct dose, in the correct dosing interval and for the correct period as prescribed. They should also be prescribed for the shortest possible um, uh, uh, period. Now, the second uh, uh, is to promote infection and uh, 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 infection prevention and control uh, practices um, in uh, hospitals and in particular also in healthcare, uh, in, in long-term care facilities. And that could start with hand hygiene which I find particularly um, uh, attractive because it's not only uh, reducing the, the, the transmission of antimicrobial uh, resistant bacteria, but also other things. We have seen it now for COVID. It uh, helps reducing the transmission of influenza. So it's a simple measure that is really um, uh, addressing a lot of uh, different issues. Now, the third uh, strategy would be to promote uh, research and development of new antibiotics that have a different um, uh, or new uh, mechanisms of, of uh, um, uh, action uh, because uh, uh, bacterial resistance uh, uh, builds uh, over time. Now, even if we have such new antibiotics, we still do have to ha uh, 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 use them uh, uh, prudently and we need to implement the infection prevention and control practices because otherwise, even with the new uh, antibiotics, we are back to where we are right now. Okay, it's amazing how something as simple as hand hygiene could be so effective. It's incredible. So then, Andrea, th thank you very much for that then. Whose responsibility is it then to address the issue of antimicrobial resistance? And more importantly, I suppose, do we still have time? Well, I, uh, we need, of course, uh, uh, organizations and persons promoting uh, antimicrobial uh, uh, measures against an antimicrobial resistance. But in the end, it comes down to every single one of us. And um, we all, uh, including you and myself, uh, are responsible because we uh, potentially may suffer from uh, bacterial infections and are potential users of antibiotics. Uh, we may be parents uh, who have children that may suffer from uh, infections and are also potential users of antibiotics. And uh, since it's all not only humans that uh, can get infected, but also food producing animals, companion animals, uh, it is also very important to uh, see this from a One Health perspective. There is still time, not much, but there is still time to, to, to turn the tide. But um, uh, it is um, uh, a matter of uh, us all realizing that it's up to us to make sure that antibiotics work for future generations. Well, at least there's a little bit of uh, hope there, Andrea. So on this 2021 European Antibiotics Awareness Day, what for you do you think is the most important message you would like to give to those watching our seminar online? Well, I mean, of course, uh, since the beginning of last year, everybody focused mostly on COVID. Uh, uh, and that was of, is, of course, uh, uh, quite, quite rightly so. However, we can't forget that there are other threats. Um, and you mentioned in the, uh, uh, or, or Sandra Galina mentioned that it's a silent pandemic uh, that's going on uh, uh, in parallel, actually. So what we need to do is to improve the infection prevention and control practices in hospitals and other healthcare settings to continue 
to enforce some of the lessons that we learned now from the from the pandemic uh, in terms of the hand hygiene, in terms of physical distancing, in terms of uh, uh, respiratory etiquette and also vaccination. Uh, and then we should continue our efforts to reduce the unnecessary antibiotic use in any role that we have by, uh, uh, in, in, in society. In the end, all of us have to work together to um, keep antibiotics working. OK, well, very good message there at the very end. Thank you so much, Andrea Amon, the director of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, the ECDC, for joining us from your studios in Stockholm. Um, so now our final keynote speaker will deliver his message also by way of a video. Hans Kluge is the WHO Regional Director for Europe. Let's play that video now. Dear friends and colleagues, COVID-19 has hit us hard. Many, if not all countries in the WHO European region are once more struggling with increased transmission, as well as with the extensive, wide-ranging impact on health systems, gender and social equity, education, and not the least, the economy. But while fighting one health emergency, we can never let our guard down in the fight against other health threats. Antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, is the slow tsunami building up on the horizon. Six years ago, AMR was declared one of the major health threats to humans, and the WHO Global Action Plan on AMR was developed. But awareness and the sense of urgency is still lacking among politicians and in countries around the world. Not only does AMR complicate the treatment of acute and chronic diseases in individual patients, it also has a major impact on populations and the global economy, deepening inequality and poverty. The World Bank has estimated that if nothing is done to address the factors driving AMR, it will have the same impact and cost as much as COVID-19. Not once, but annually, year after year. COVID-19 is forcing us to fight health threats on multiple fronts, simultaneously. AMR is there, among the gravest of challenges. Antibiotic use is a major driver. From self-reporting of antibiotic use during the pandemic, gathered from WHO member states in Eastern European and Central Asia, we know that over time antibiotic use rose. We know that access to antibiotics is a great concern, that over-the-counter sales still occur in parts of our region, that the antibiotics available are often the ones associated with the highest risk of developing resistance. We know that the use of fluoroquinolones not only cause resistance in the most common bacteria, but in mycobacterium tuberculosis, TB, still an immense threat in our region. And we know that AMR is not only caused by access to and misuse of antibiotics, but also of antiparasitic and antifungal drugs. We know that some physicians also lack the knowledge or time to be able to answer patients' questions on infection treatment. And we also know that doctors often do not have access to diagnostics, benchmarking systems and the simple opportunity to monitor prescriptions. For many prescribers and pharmacists, no training models exist on prescribing and selling antibiotics. Antibiotics are not only used to treat humans, but also to prevent and treat diseases in animals. Antimicrobial drugs are circulating in streams and rivers due to excretion into wastewater at production sites and hospitals. 
Drug leftovers are binned or flushed away in people's homes and then enter the environment. That makes AMR a One Health issue that has to be addressed and managed at the human-animal-environmental interface. To tackle this, the WHO Regional Office for Europe is working on high alert, supporting member states in developing regional and national action plans, designing and implementing what's needed to prevent antimicrobial resistance. This is what the European program of work is all about, working in partnership to deliver tangible results. In a holistic, integrated way, we aim to increase people's knowledge about antibiotics and AMR across all sectors and levels and enable them to take action. Our audience is politicians, health professionals, academics and the general public. To make sure that the aware classification of antibiotics, access, watch, reserve is widely known and used, and to ensure that infection prevention and control programs become standard in all healthcare systems, antibiotics and other antimicrobials are to be included in the essential medicine list of national medical agencies and hospitals. We support member states in establishing and sustaining better lab capacity and in building surveillance programs for monitoring and managing both antimicrobial resistant bacteria and other microorganisms. Last year, together with FAO, OIE and UNEP, WHO Europe created a One Health coordination mechanism consisting of two groups, executive and technical, for a strategic, concerted, aligned regional effort. Next week, we will convene our first meeting with potential partners and donors to start discussions on specific, concrete projects to be undertaken in our region. This Advocacy Week is a valuable opportunity to raise awareness, to bolster the understanding of how grave the threat is, to highlight the challenges and solutions and make people realize they can be part of the solution, to make sure everyone knows, from the physician in a rural health facility to a patient in a hospital waiting room, how to prevent and tackle AMR. Every one of us has a vital part to play to fight the urgent threat of antimicrobial resistance. I wish you the best of success in our joint work. Thank you. Hans Kluge there, the WHO Regional Director for Europe. Well, now it's time for our panel debate when we will discuss the findings related to antibiotic use in the EU EEA countries, as well as the WHO European region. I would like to welcome all of our panelists now onto our virtual stage. They are Dominique Monette, the head of section Antimicrobial Resistance and Healthcare Associated Infections in the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, the ECDC. We're also joined by Ute Suingson, Technical Officer, Antimicrobial Resistance Division of Country Health Programmes with the WHO's Regional Office for Europe. Also joining us is Barbara Freishem, Head of Department Veterinary Surveillance and Regulatory Support Veterinary Division with the European Medicines Agency. And finally, our final guest is Dr. Ernesto Liabana, Head of BioContam Unit with the European Food Safety Authority. You're all very, very welcome. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to put some questions to each one of you now to answer. I'm going to start off with you, uh, Dominique Monette. And in fact, you are also in the ECDC's studios in Stockholm. Today, of course, as we've been saying, the ECDC is publishing its update on antimicrobial consumption in EU EEA countries. We've already heard about some of the findings from Dr. Andrea Amon. So could you expand a little bit more then on 
the changes that may have occurred in 2020. Yes, good, good morning. So you heard from Dr. Amon that overall for antibody consumption in human, there was a 15% decrease. If we look at it by separating the community, that is primary care and uh, hospi the hospital sector, we can see first for the community that there have been overall an 18% decrease for the EUEA of the mean antibody consumption between 2019 and 2020. And as shown on this graph, the decrease were, was reported by all EUEA countries with only one country reporting an increase in red. In the hospital sector, and this is shown on the right uh, part of this slide, the pattern was less clear. About two thirds of the countries reported a decrease in antibody consumption between 2019 and 2020, while the remaining countries reported an increase. Oh, Dominique, sorry. OK, well, I think maybe because I'm not clear whether you're waiting for another slide or not. When you finish, that can uh, uh, go for all of you. Just go back to back to you, Karen. It's one of the perils of online stuff is you're not quite sure when a speaker um, has finished. OK, very interesting, uh, Dominique. So what do you think then would be the main reasons for the decrease in antibiotic consumption in, in primary care than in most of the EU EEA countries for 2020? Dr. Amon provided some, some clues about it, but let me go through through them again. So first, we see a decrease in antibody consumption for antibiotics that are usually prescribed for community-acquired respiratory tract infections, such as the penicillins. And the European surveillance system confirmed a low incidence of non-COVID-related respiratory tract infection in 2020 in the EU EEA. So, we believe that as, as a response to the COVID pandemic, and since the countries had implemented uh, measures or so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions, physical distancing, lockdown, respiratory etiquette, use of face masks, promotion of hand hygiene, these not only stopped transmission of COVID, and that was why they were implemented, the common respiratory viruses. And in addition, there's been a decrease in the number of primary care consultations either because of hesitancy to seek health care for mild uh, or self-limiting infections, or difficulties even to obtain an appointment with a general practitioner. So we believe that all these uh, contributed to the decrease that we're observing in almost all countries. Okay, and you showed that this pattern was less clear for the hospital sector with a decrease in only about two thirds of EU EEA countries. What do you think is the reason for that? Yeah, obviously, I and mean, this is clear on the slide, but the pattern is less clear. But I would be careful at this stage to interpret the difference in consumption in the hospital sector. In particular, there have been major changes in bed occupancy and patient case mix in European hospitals in 2020 because of the COVID pandemic. And these are not accounted for in the data that are reported by EU EA countries to ISACnet. So obviously at ECDC, we need to analyze these uh, differences further. OK, uh, Dominique, thank you very much for that. You're going to stay in the studios because we will, of course, uh, come back to you. I want to go to you now, though, Ute Suing Sun. Um, what is the situation with antimicrobial consumption in the whole of the WHO European region? Yes, thank you, Karen, and good morning to everybody. Um, I will take you a bit back in time, and uh, the reason is that we don't have very good data for the eastern part of the region for 2019 and 2020. So let me start showing you a graph that was published in June this year, where we have a combined uh, monitoring of antibiotic usage for both the ECDC and the WHO Europe AMC network. And when you look at the middle of the figure, you can see where the EEA, EE, EU and EA countries are and where the WHO AMC countries are. And you will notice that there is a difference in colors. So at the bottom, we have the, uh, the beta lactams, the penicillins. Then we have um, other types of beta lactams, which typically are cephalosporins. Um, we 
can look at macrolides and we can look at quinolones. And you will notice that there is a much higher degree of penicillins used in the EU countries than in the non-EU countries. Um, there's a much higher use of cephalosporins in the non-EU countries. And then we also tend towards using fluoroquinolones. So there is a difference in patterns. And from preliminary data, 4, 19 and 20, we know that this difference in pattern has even become bigger. Over to you again, Karen. Okay, very good. So, so let's talk then a little bit about the why the usage patterns differ then so much between the EU and the non-EU countries. What information do you have on that? Well, we think that is due to several reasons, actually. One of the main reasons is that uh, primary care accounts for the highest number of antibiotics consumed. And we know that in many of the non-EU countries, over-the-counter sale still takes place and, and it happens at a very fast pace and it has even been increasing during the pandemic. We know from Behavioral Insight that um, the use of fluoroquinolones particularly has increased quite dramatically. And just we, on that, yes, sorry, yeah, go on ahead. Yes, yes. no, no, no. Just, just on that point, then what's your greatest concern related to the higher, higher use of fluoroquinolones in the non-EU countries? Well, there, there are several. The one thing is that fluoroquinolones are, are definitely the antibiotics that give the highest risk of development of resistance. So whenever you use them, you can almost directly and immediately see a, an AMR response. The other really worrying concern is that we know that the rate of multidrug resistant tuberculosis is quite high in the non-EU countries and it's increasing. It's very difficult to tackle. Um, we have a lot of programs on that and fluoroquinolones have been defined as one of the major antibiotics to be used for multidrug resistant tuberculosis. So if they are used over the counter and used for all kinds of other reasons, then we cannot reserve them. And to reserve antibiotics is a really important issue for us. And that is why we also have uh, revisited the AWARE categorization and tried to make it even more clear that some Antibiotics definitely need to be accessible, but some need to be reserved. And how do you do that, though? How do you get that message across? That is, we are trying to work with campaigns, just as the CDC does. And today is a great day of celebrating these campaigns. And we're trying to teach the, the community and the society to be better in using antibiotics, to understanding that antibiotics should not be used for viral disease. And right now, particularly not against COVID-19 because they will not be effective. And I think that's one of our main areas where we really try to focus. Okay, thank you very much for the moment, Ute. Uh, we will come back to you, but I'm going to go to you now, uh, Barbara Freisham, Head of Department of Veterinary Surveillance and Regulatory Support veterinary division with the European Medicines Agency. Let's talk about antimicrobial consumption in animals. What is the situation there? Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm waiting for the right slide to come up so that the uh, participants can actually see what's happening. At the European Medicines Agency, we've been monitoring the trends of antimicrobial consumption in animals. Uh, since 2009, and um, I'm showing you two pictures on this uh, slide. Um, and, and one of them uh, shows you uh, a trend over time. Uh, that's on the left-hand side of the slide. The other uh, 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 right-hand side picture shows you the spatial distribution in the re last report we published last year, and uh, that was reporting 2018 data. I really like the uh, slide on the second, uh, the the uh, graph on the second, uh, on the left hand side of the slide. Apologies, uh, which shows, uh, if you look at the green line, uh, a consistent and significant decrease, uh, decrease of overall use of antimicrobials in uh, food producing animals over time. Uh, this uh, picture is taken from the JIACRA 3 report that was published in June of this year and uh, you can also see that uh, consumption levels on a per kilogram basis 
in animals um, uh, during the reporting period of this uh, JIACRA report decreased uh, below the consumption values of um, in people at the time. So, so I'm, I'm really uh, uh, proud to see that because it does show that um, the policies in the individual member states um, are working and that farmers and veterinarians uh, are really uh, changing how they use antimicrobials also in animals. Um, if you look at the right hand slide um, of the picture, you, do, you see the spatial distribution of antimicrobials and you will see the uh, acronym PCU, milligram per PCU. PCU is uh, the way how we measure it in animals, but it is an equivalent of um, a kilogram uh, biomass of animals treated. Uh, and you will see a certain uh, north-south distribution, uh, perhaps some uh, east-west distribution as well. Um, it's uh, perhaps uh, similar to the pattern seen on the human side. Now, uh, not to be a spoiled spot, our next uh, SVAC report, so the report on the antimicrobial consumption in animals, will be out towards the end of the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week uh, on the 23rd of November. And uh, But uh, just as a little spoiler, uh, I can say that the uh, trends toward decrease of antimicrobial use in animals continues. Um, I would like to uh, also draw uh, your attention on the right hand slide. I, I mentioned uh, specific classes of antimicrobials. Um, a few years back, um, ECDC, EFSA and EMA uh, uh, together um, developed indicators of um, uh, use well, indicators of uh, that are uh, important for member states to focus on, and uh, the classes of antimicrobials we highlight were those uh, considered most important for both human and animal uh, um, therapies. Uh, so uh, we want to make sure uh, that we use least of those uh, antimicrobials uh, that are also important for uh, human therapy. And I think with that, I'm done. You're handing over to me. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. Maybe I can put an additional question to you. And by the way, we're getting loads and loads of questions in from um, those watching online. I'll try to get to a couple of them and, and one even directly for you now, Barbara. But I'll, I'll ask you maybe just one question first as a follow up to very interesting information you're giving there and, and, and positive in terms of some of the decreases and the farmers and the vets are changing how they use them, which is good. But is the decrease in use happening in all of the EU member states? Well, as Tom said, uh, uh, for the human side, it's, it's uh, perhaps a similar picture on the uh, veterinary side. Uh, in a few countries, uh, over the time uh, we've been monitoring trends, uh, there also has has been uh, an increase in use, but uh, we have to uh, bear in mind that um, the goal is to ensure uh, responsible and prudent use of antimicrobials, not reduction at all costs. Uh, animals need to be treated, uh, animals in our care need to be treated to the same degree uh, that uh, people that are sick need to be treated. So, um, But it also indicates that perhaps there is still um, room for improvement and um, uh, seeing the overall decline is perhaps also uh, a uh, motivation uh, to uh, all countries in the EU uh, to see that we can really uh, uh, effect change if we try to. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for that. Can I just ask those of you watching us online, will you keep your questions quite short, please? Don't make long sentences because it's, it's going to be very difficult to keep a track of them. So if you wouldn't mind, please keep the questions short. And if there's someone in particular you want to direct it to, please let me know as well. And we'll try and get to as many of them as possible. But I want to go now to Dr. Ernesto uh, Lee, Liabana, head of Biocontam Unit with the European Food Safety 
authority. So from your point of view, Ernesto, what is the current picture from harmonized surveillance of AMR in food producing animals in the EU? Have any positive trends been observed? Thank you, Karen, and good morning, everybody. It's, it's my pleasure to be here today um, taking part on this discussion. So, yes, I will start with the bad news first. And I have to say that we observed in food production animals and foods still high level of uh, resistant zoonotic bacteria, especially to those antimicrobials which are commonly used in animals such as ampicillin, uh, sulfonamide or, or tetracycline. And uh, there is a marked variation uh, of resistance levels across countries. But then I come to the to the good news because we have also starting to to, to see uh, positive trends. As an example, the uh, percentage of uh, E. coli from food production animals that uh, show resistance due to ESBLs. So these are resistance, for example, to um, third and fourth generation cephalosporins has decreased in about 48% of, of the member states. And now on the slide you have uh, on your screens, this is uh, what we call our key outcome indicator. So it's kind of a summary indicator uh, and it, it is about the percentage of E. coli, which is can be considered as, as a, an indicator bacteria for the level of resistance, which are fully susceptible to all the antimicrobials we have in our testing uh, panels. So we compute this indicator and as you can see from the slide, uh, the the countries, all the member states are represented and the size of the bars represents the amount of resistance we observe. So the first thing you see is an immediate striking difference in, in different countries. However, when we do a computation of all this data for all the animal species and all the, the countries, we have observed that there is an increase in trends. So there is an increase in the number of fully susceptible E. coli in about 25% of the member states. So we are seeing already some encouraging progress and that perhaps follows what Barbara presented before, that there is really a, a major effort uh, in member states to decrease the levels of antimicrobials used in, in uh, food production animals. Um, and if you go to the next slide, uh, please. Then, of course, the question is, uh, we're interested in uh, correlating these levels of resistance we see with the amounts of antimicrobials we use. And we do that uh, periodically in what we call our joint interagency report on integrated analysis of uh, antimicrobial consumption and occurrence. We do this in partnership with our ACDC and EMA colleagues. And on this slide, I just want to show that there is a clear correlation in, in those cases, those uh, substances such as quinolones, uh, polymyxins, aminopenicillins and tetracyclines, the, the higher the use in food producing animals, the higher uh, the levels of resistance we observe also in E. coli from, uh, from food production animals. But we don't stop here. We also do correlation analysis across sectors. And in the next slide, please, here I want to show that in a specific cases, we have also shown that there is correlation between the levels of resistance uh, in uh, animals and the levels of resistance in humans. This is a very clear example on fluoroquinolones resistance in, in uh, E. coli. So this is influenced by the levels of use in animals, but also the levels that we see of resistance in human uh, uh, E. coli, fluoroquinolone resistance are in this case affected by the levels we see in animals. So we're all interconnected and that is why it's so important to have this One Health uh, view on the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. Over to you, Karen. OK, very interesting, Ernesto. And then, so what are the potential mitigation measures that could be taken? And indeed, what evidence is there that they would work? Thank you for the question. Yes, we have been advocating um, three main things that one could uh, envisage as mitigation options. The, the first thing is, is a no-brainer really, and it has been said by, by several of our speakers today and, and, and panelists, and is try to use antimicrobials prudently. So reduce as much as possible the amount of antimicrobials we use. And this can be done uh, using a, a number of, of uh, instruments such as setting targets, uh, for example, at, at uh, country level or sector level. 
So it's reducing is the first action one can think of. The second one is uh, replacing and is finding alternatives and especially for, for animals, finding other things uh, uh, one could use uh, to try to replace replace the use of, of these uh, agents, these drugs. And the third one is rethinking and that's a very important one, is rethinking the way we do husbandry uh, nowadays for our food production animals, ensuring that we give them the best possible environment, uh, promoting their welfare and their health so that there is less uh, prone to disease and less uh, use of antimicrobials overall. And I have to end up by saying that there is unfortunately no one size uh, fits all solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to look at all these possibilities in an integrated, multifaceted uh, approach involving a, a variety of stakeholders and convincing these stakeholders that we all have to be united in, in, in these efforts. Thank you. Over to you, Karen. Okay, Ernesto, I'm just thinking when you talk about, you know, more humane care of animals, how does that fit with the kind of mass production models that we have in terms of meat production out there? Well, of, of course, the way we raise our animals nowadays uh, has to comply with a, with certain European law. So uh, welfare of the animals is ensured. Uh, even if it is uh, mass production, you can still provide the environments, the health plans, the vaccination strategies to these animals to live um, lives which, which, which are uh, ensuring their welfare and healthy lives. And in any case, uh, these laws are in continuous review and right now also in the European Union there is a, a large effort to, to look at the welfare of animals in different production sectors and, and the urine transport and especially in, in EFSA we are working on that and a number of opinions uh, uh, advising the European Commission will come out uh, soon. Thank you. Okay, uh, stay with us there. I'm going to take um, some questions now because from our um, audience watching online, we've had a lot of reaction. If there isn't, um, if it's not obvious who the question should be directed to, will you just physically, um, panelists, put up your hand if it's a question that uh, might suit you? But first of all, a comment from Prabin Pradeep. Thank you for your comment, uh, Prabin. Says more strict regulations for antimicrobial drugs is needed, as in many pharmacies, it is available as an over the counter without prescription. While there's a question here from Steph Bronzeware, and forgive me if I get the pronunciations wrong here, but anyway, Steph says great to see the EMA, the ECDC, the EFSA, and the WHO Europe united on this one health issue. Question from Steph is, what can we learn from countries that manage to keep AMR levels low? What would be a game changer to tackle AMR? Um, who would like to answer that question? Dominique, would that be a question that you could take? I can try. Do. There are um, a lot of best practices from the countries that uh, are keeping antibody consumption and antibody resistance low. In primary care, those countries, for example, are able to produce prescription patterns per GP or per uh, primary care practice and offer to the prescribers a benchmark of their practices compared to the guidelines and compared to their uh, peer uh, general practitioners and practices. This is a good practice. This is something that is done in the Netherlands. This is something that is done in uh, Nordic countries could be applied everywhere, as long as the data on prescriptions at prescriber level are available. Okay, Uta, did you have your hand up as well? Would you like to contribute to that? Yes, I did. I, I would like to say that uh, for the non-EU countries, obviously there's a, a lot of things to be done, um, but we know that uh, from a European uh, project, the EU GEMRI, uh, many countries were quite happy, that is within the EU, but many countries were quite happy to have twinning exercises and, and to have countries visiting each other and learn from each other. And for the non-EU countries, I think one of the very major problems is, uh, of course, the accessibility to antibiotics, but also that we have experts that are really, really very knowledgeable about their topic and their area, but they're very isolated. So if they can learn more about collaboration, but also being part of a network, I think that in itself would strengthen a lot of what is going on. 
Okay, very good. We have another question in here from Janiv Stenuik. Uh, Janiv wants to know, um, antimicrobial residues can also be discharged during production into the environment where they can drive resistance. Which measures is the EU considering to ensure more sustainable manufacturing practices? Now, which one of you would like to... Okay, Uta, or not Uta, sorry, Barbara, over to you. Thank you. I, I can at least try to make a start on that. Um, it, it's a difficult question in general, but um, because uh, much of antimicrobial production is not taking a place in Europe. If you look at the uh, uh, production of uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, a lot of the production is happening in Asia. Uh, that said, of course, um, um, it, it's um, something to keep in mind and uh, Anissa can perhaps help. Uh, we, we do need to uh, learn a lot more about uh, antimicrobial resistance in the environment and how, um, how, how we can um, impact that. Uh, but um, where, uh, and the Commission is also considering uh, specific uh, actions on uh, um, reducing antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Um, colleagues at the agency participate in these discussions, um, but a lot is also dependent on diplomacy um, and uh, best practices and education, uh, because of course we can't tell countries who produce antimicrobial what measures they need to put in place to reduce uh, antimicrobial um, resistance in the environment that comes from the production of antimicrobials. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Barbara. I'm just going to take one more question from our online audience for the moment. It's a long one, uh, but I'll try to read it out quickly from Simone Mancini. So Simone says antibiotics are one of the main tools to fight sepsis. The autoimmune dysregulated response to infections. As Kluge and Amon have said, AMR is a silent pandemic. AMR hampers the treatment of sepsis that costs around 700,000 lives in Europe every year, affecting more than 3 million people. And then she says some more stuff, but I'm going to shorten it with her question, which is, what do speakers think about including sepsis in ECDC and Commission's relevant work streams? So Dominique, maybe, um, do you want to take that question on first? Well, th thank, thank you, Simone, for, for the question. And you are um, part of a global sepsis alliance, so I'm, I know where, why you're asking this question. Uh, there are discussions right now about a new mandate for ECDC and an extension of this mandate. Obviously, sep sepsis is not a communicable disease. So as, as of now, ECDC does not work with sepsis. ECDC can collect data on bloodstream infections, but not sepsis as a, as a condition. Now, if sepsis is included as part of the special health issues that are covered by the ECDC mandate in the future, of course, ECDC will work with sepsis and the EUEA countries will have to collect data and report this data to, to ECDC. But we cannot say anything before uh, we see the final and approved mandate for ECDC. Okay, thanks, uh, Dominique. Now let's maybe move on to take a broader perspective in our discussion. We've still loads of questions coming in. Please do keep them coming in and I will get to some more as well, some of them very relevant. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Ernesto. Um, first of all, I suppose, how much do we know about the role of the food production environment in the overall problem of AMR? We touched on it there earlier. Thank you, Karen. Yes, uh, EFSA has recently been looking into, into this uh, aspect. Somehow the environment in general has been a neglected um, uh, sector in, in our surveillance, uh, monitoring and surveillance efforts. So we, we thought it was a good idea to start looking into what is what is known uh, about this. So we, in, in our work, we did not look at the effect of residues. In fact, we were looking directly at uh, what was the contribution of the food production environment in terms of contamination with resistant bacteria or resistance genes. 
and we looked at uh, sources of, of these two elements in the main uh, production uh, sector, so in plant-based uh, uh, foods, in aquaculture and in terrestrial animal uh, production. And, and really to summarize the long story uh, in, in a few uh, lines is that in general, uh, fertilizers of fecal origin or contamination of fertilizers with uh, fecal material, uh, being that human or animal, is, is one of the main sources, as well as the contamination of the water that we use for our irrigation uh, of uh, fresh produce, for example, or our aquaculture uh, systems. So these are the most significant sources uh, in, in this case for plants and for uh, fish. In in the case of terrestrial animal production, there are many potential sources such as feed, uh, contamination from humans, uh, the, the water that is used in the systems, the air, dust, soil, uh, contact with wildlife, uh, equipment. And, but for most of these, uh, there are still significant data gaps. When uh, one tries to find in literature hard evidence, it's, it's difficult, although we believe uh, uh, all these uh, sources that I mentioned are important. We also looked into risk factors, and there are several. Uh, of course, the main one is the use of antimicrobials, but also how we do, do we approach biosecurity, general hygiene conditions, also the bacteria themselves, they have certain traits uh, like the ability to form biofilms, the ability to uh, exchange horizontally genes, uh, they, they do this uh, between them. Um, and also the way we do uh, the, the cleaning, for example, of the environment in the, in the farms after we replace animals uh, going out for uh, slaughter, for example, with new batches of animals. And also uh, a very, very difficult one to tackle is the general uh, microbiota. The, the bacteria existing in natural environments, they are a reservoir of potential resistance, determinants that can jump into uh, zoonotic uh, bacteria in this case. So in a nutshell, uh, this, is, uh, this is a bit uh, where we are in, in trying to understand the role of the food production environment in, in all this problem. Thank you, Karen. So a lot of issues there, um, some may be easier to resolve than others, but you talk about contaminated fertilizers and other issues. So what can be done to try and tackle at least some of these problems? Yes, and, and I think uh, the, the main uh, actions that could be put into place here is, of course, to, to continue to improve our general biosecurity and hygiene in food production from the primary production at the farm level to the uh, food production, food uh, processing environments, but also uh, measures uh, aimed to reduce the fecal microbial contamination are quite important. So the, the, the use uh, of uh, manure that is somehow treated in a way uh, where you have a lower uh, bacterial load and, and that can reduce the contamination of the uh, food uh, um, after uh, using them. And also to try to come with better ways of uh, waste water treatment. So a, a multiple barrier approach here, mixing low impact approaches uh, with more sophisticated advanced uh, water treatment technologies uh, could be really playing a, a, an important um, um, role in, in how do we tackle this problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ernesto. There are questions coming in for you, but I'll try to get to them a little bit later. I want to go back uh, to you, Barbara, if I may, please, because over the last number of years, the EMA has been working on advice on the use of certain antibiotics in animals. Can you tell us a little bit more about that work? Thank you very much for that question. Yes, I think it's very important work that we carry out at the EMA and we've done so for a number of years. So uh, on the slide you can see since uh, 2013. Um, and initially, uh, it, were, it was specific questions that we received from the Commission on uh, specific antimicrobials of interest in uh, human medicine, but also how can we uh, um, direct uh, use, uh, veterinary use of antimicrobials uh, that are important in uh, humans uh, by, and, and by classifying them perhaps into categories. 
um, and uh, also um, looking into uh, uh, a topic that uh, a number of uh, the participants raised in the chat, authorization of new antimicrobials, and especially for use in animals, uh, what's important to consider uh, when we authorize that med uh, such medicines, especially for um, human therapy. Um, and uh, the last um, aspect of the original question from the Commission was uh, what risk mitigation measures um, for authorized veterinary medicines can be put in place when these um, medicines are also um, important in human therapy. Uh, we've updated the advice on one of the uh, uh, antimicrobials in question, colicin, in 2016, and we completely updated the categorization of antimicrobials um, that are important for human use. Um, early last year, including an infographic that's um, available in uh, basically all EU um, languages. So I think that's really uh, important guidance to veterinarians uh, on, on um, selecting um, antimicrobials um, that for therapy of animals when these antimicrobials, well, in consideration of their importance uh, in human therapy. But if you look at the right side of the slide, um, we're moving from recommendations and advice into uh, the domain of uh, a new legal basis. And uh, we have a regulation um, that uh, um, determines how veterinary medicines are going to be authorized from uh, 28th of January next year onward. Regulation 2019-6 uh, that I've been spending the past uh, three years on implementing the measures and uh, a key intention of that regulation is to um, um, put in place concrete measures uh, against antimicrobial resistance in a in a one health approach and and that really contains a number of measures um, such as banning the preventive use of antimicrobials in animals uh, an extended ban of the use of antimicrobials um, for uh, um, for growth promotion and yield increase, uh, restrictions on metaphylactic use, and um, of course of uh, particular interest to your question, a ban on use uh, in animals of antimicrobials uh, that are designated uh, as reserved for human use. Um, and on that one, we're currently still working on that. Uh, the criteria for designating such antimicrobials as reserved for human use were published in early October. And um, at the agency, uh, with uh, participations of experts from EFSA and ECDC and uh, anti uh, human um, infectious disease specialists, we're currently finalizing an advice on a list of antimicrobials that should be reserved for human use only. But the additional um, uh, legal um, provisions of the regulation also include, well, what else if uh, can we do if we uh, uh, shouldn't uh, if we're not banning antimicrobials, can we um, put conditions and restrictions on um, certain types of use uh, that is allowed legally in animals and that's using antimicrobials um, outside the terms of their marketing authorizations when there is a medical need in the animals. Uh, we call that cascade use and uh, it's allowed, but the new legislation gives us measures that we can uh, prohibit such off-label use or we can put really strict conditions uh, on such use. And uh, also um, we were talking about uh, data collection earlier on. Um, um, we are moving uh, to the collection of actual use data of antimicrobials 
per animal species. That's not coming immediately next year. That's going to be implemented uh, over a certain uh, time period. And um, the last bit um, that the legislation puts in place really in a, in a one health um, approach is that uh, whenever we authorize antimicrobial medicines, it needs to be done in in a way that ensures prudent and responsible use. So, um, when we make those decisions, we need to keep uh, all of that in mind. Okay. Okay. So, Barbara, I'm conscious that I do want to get to the rest of our panelists. That was super. Thank you very much for that. We may be able to go back to you with some follow up questions from our audience. But I want to go to you again, uh, Dominique Monette. The ECDC is, is monitoring AMR in human infections and, and it's just published its 2020 update. But has there been any change during the past years? And I suppose why should some antimicrobials be reserved for use in humans? Yes, th thank you. So like we, we said previously, we just released our data on antimicrobial resistance in the European Union. And these are data from the European Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network, EARSnet, oh, and, and previously EARS. And on this slide, we managed to put the trend for the EU EA mean since 2002. What you will see that for some bacteria, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and some antibiotics, third generation cephalosporins, carbapenems, and these are the, the lines in orange, brown, and red. There's something seems to have happened between 2010 and 2015. Um, the, the Increasing trends seems to have stopped, so it's not ideal, but at least it's not increasing anymore. So something may have happened. Uh, we had, uh, we found that it is related to a similar stop in the increase in the consumption of third generation cephalosporins and carbapenems in humans. Keep in mind that carbapenems are not authorized for use in uh, in food animals and in animals in general, which means that if we have uh, unnecessary carbapenem use, if we have high carbapenem resistance, well, we are the problem. The healthcare professionals are the problem and we need to give a solution. Now for other drug drug combinations, let's look at the pink line, carbapenem resistant in acinetobacter, or the green line, carbapenem resistant in pseudomonas aeruginosa. The resistance uh, percentages are, are quite high overall for the EU. And then uh, if we look at the purple line, it's even increasing as mentioned by the ECDC director. So we need effective antibiotics to, to treat those infections. And if some of the antibiotics for which there is resistance in humans, and we've seen that there's sometimes a link between antibiotics being used in humans, in, in animals, resistance in bacteria from animals, and this being transferred to, to humans, then we need to make sure that there are effective antibiotics to treat infections in humans. And in some cases, it makes sense to reserve such last line antibiotics for use in humans. Make sure that resistance does not build up in other sectors and in particular in food producing animals. Now the picture that I showed you is for the whole of the EU and it is the average for countries that have very high resistance and countries that have much lower resistance. You're probably familiar to those maps that you can find in the ECDC surveillance atlas of infectious diseases showing again um, low resistance in the north and in the west of Europe and higher resistance in the east and in the south of Europe. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique. And, and it can be hard now to see all the um, fine details in, in the slide, but the, has there been any change between 2019 and 2020 in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic? So if we look at the, the slide again, you will see that there are changes, the last two data points on the left graph, and there seem to have been changes a bit larger than usual between 2019 and, and 2020. But this may just be because the UK is not included in our 2020 data, or it could be something else. 
for example, increase in resistance because of the COVID pandemic. One thing is sure that the changes in these uh, percentages for the EU EA overall are not very large. Obviously, we, we need to dig further to, to better understand these changes at EU EA level and in the uh, Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dominique. Now, I want to go back to you, Ote, for another question, which is a very, I think, from, from your perspective, it's going to be very interesting for us on the overview of the antimicrobial resistance in Europe. I know you have something new coming up on that. I think for the first time, the whole picture of AMR in the European region may be given. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Thank you, Karen. And we are indeed really happy that this has finally happened. We have been working hard towards it for some years now. Um, when you go and look at the slide, you can see that I'm again going to take you a bit back in time. Uh, on the left, you have a slide from 2012. You recognize the map that uh, Dominique just showed, but then you also can see uh, the rest of the European region. So the WHO Europe covers not only the EU countries, but also Eastern Europe, Balkan, Central Asia, Caucasus, and uh, the Russian Federation. So it's a very vast geographic area. Um, the CISO network was established in 2012. And back then you can see there was just a handful of countries. A lot of countries were asked to participate, but uh, only a handful could join us in the beginning. And the aim was really to, to build better laboratory systems and then increase the availability to microbiological uh, diagnostics in this part of the region. And I think also when we look back to the antibiotic use we've just been discussing, um, it was quite important to know what are we actually treating when we are treating something. It makes it easier for our clinicians. And then the long-term goal was, of course, to build a stable surveillance system and uh, relying on routine clinical samples of AMR rather than on very specific selected samples taken very infrequently. And, and so we have been focusing very much on UCAST being implemented. We have been focusing very much on having an increasing number of labs participate. And in recent years, we've talked very much about whole genome sequencing and how that can be included in the routine diagnostics. So all of these things need to happen so we can build a surveillance system. So when you know that the EU or some of the EU countries by now have been doing surveillance of AMR for 25 years, uh, then for the CISA network, some of the countries have just recently started, so they are definitely a bit behind. And so we're really happy that this is finally happening. And when you look at the 2021, you can see that now the network covers uh, the whole area and many countries are participating. Some are just on the verge of being part of it. And you can see that the UK now joined the CISA network. So happily, we also still have the UK with us, which is really nice. Very good, very interesting. And um, I suppose maybe a follow up to uh, that. Um, what do the increasing numbers of submitted results show and from an increasing number of member states? Yes, so what happens is that we can see that the rate of assistance is much higher in the non-EU countries than in the EU. And Dominic talked about the, the north-south gradient and the west-east gradient, even within the EU countries. Um, for the non-EU countries and the further east we move, the higher rates of resistance do we have. And for example, we know that carbapenem resistance is really high um, in Astinxobacta. Um, from intensive care patients, but also from other patients. We know that E. coli, which is one of our best indicator bacteria uh, for MAR monitoring, has levels to third generation cephalosporins and fluoroquinolones that uh, are between 35 and 80 percent, which is a lot. And we know that many Klebsiella pneumoniae from bloodstream infections more often are multi-resistant than they are susceptible. So that is definitely a problem and, and we need to highlight that and we need to have even more knowledge. And, and we believe that some of the, these high rates probably owe to the fact that countries have just begun sampling. So they are sampling the most sick patients, the patients on intensive care. Um, but over time, um, that will level out a bit, but still the rates are really high and that is concerning. Um, yes. 
Okay, thank you very much for that, Uta. Now, um, very, very inter interesting information from all of you. We just only have about maybe seven minutes left, and I want to try and go back to some of the many questions we've been getting in for all of you. But one for you, Ernesto, um, from Gerhard Falkenhorst. Thank you very much, Gerhard, for your question. He wants to know, what is the EFSA doing to achieve all that all EU e, 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 e countries will ban the veterinary use of antimicrobials that are deemed essential for human use by the WHO. Okay, thank you for the question. Perhaps uh, the, the immediate clarification is EFSA does not do anything in terms of banning anything. We just provide the evidence that then the Commission uses to take legislative action. So uh, with that, uh, there's very little I can say in reply to, to this question. And I think also uh, Barbara explained what EMA is doing in terms to advise also potentially on uh, substances or drugs that should be reserved for human use. So I think with all these elements together, with what we know about the levels of resistance in animals and, and the advice Emma is doing, then the Commission will have to take action and, and decide. I don't know if Barbara, you want to complement uh, anything there. Thank you. Barbara, good. Thank you, Ernesto. Barbara, do you want to come in on that? Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, Gerhard also posted a follow up to his question um, after he heard my presentation and it is indeed something we're working on. What I can say is um, we're doing exactly what the WHO recommends should be done with the list of highest priority uh, critically uh, critical antimicrobials and that is uh, look at them as priority antimicrobials um, that need to be considered for action. Um, what is happening in addition to that is that we're really putting it into the European context, which antimicrobials are used in Europe in uh, people or in animals. What disease pressure do we have? So um, uh, the, the final list that uh, we expect, uh, where we expect to publish our advice early uh, in the first two months next year, um, may not be identical to the WHO list. Also, uh, in con uh, if we uh, bear in mind that <clears throat> Uh, part of the um, prioritization uh, criteria at WHO look at the extent of use. So the more an antimicrobial is used, uh, the more, uh, the higher the uh, importance is considered uh, as part of the sub criteria. Whereas we will also want to look at the absolute last reserve antimicrobials, uh, which are not used very frequently. And, and so uh, I, I'm trying to set expectations. It uh, is likely not to be identical to the WHO highest priority list, but uh, when, where there is a deviation, it will come for a very good reason. Thank you. OK, thank you uh, for that. Uh, Corrado Minetti wanted to make what Corrado says is a very important point. The impact of residual pesticides in water from agriculture is also a problem for the development of insecticide resistance in mosquitoes if we want to draw a parallel with the AMR situation. Also, another question for you, Ernesto, maybe you could answer it very quickly. What is the contribution of animal feeds towards AMR? That's coming from Musa Kim Mohammed. Thank you. Yes, as, as I mentioned in my, my short um, presentation on the role of the environment, yes, feed is one of the sources uh, that uh, food production animals, especially terrestrial animals, uh, have for AMR bacteria because feed is uh, produced in open fields, uh, sometimes is treated or not treated, so is, as we know, um, a way of introducing salmonella and other bacteria uh, as well as resistant uh, bacteria. So it's, it's one of the sources. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Ernesto. I don't know who might uh, like to answer this question from Martina Gierich. Apologies if I have really butchered the, the pronunciation of your name. It's a difficult one to pronounce. Anyway, the question is, are there any plans to test hospital or community patients for the most resistant bacteria, such as, for example, Carba, Panamase uh, producing, I'm going to say this very slowly, 
enterobacteria, okay, to stop the spread of AMR. Hands up, who would like to answer that question? Dominique, yes. Yes, I can, I can take this one. I mean, plans to test patients, play, plan to test hospitals, this should be done. This should be done already, especially when patients are transferred between countries. So the receiving hospital should preventively, preventively transferred patient and test this patient for carriage of carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis or CRA. Uh, but also when patients are transferred between hospitals in the same country, transferred between regions in, in the same country, transferred between a long-term care facility and a hospital and back to the long-term care facility. All these are instances that may result in introducing CRA into a, a new facility and then if it's not recognized and the patient is not uh, isolated then that would be the start of spread and possibly a new outbreak. Uh, this, this is one basic thing that should be done and then there are places in a hospital where there are patients that are at risk of infection and I'm thinking about intensive care units for example where in some countries the patients are tested for carriage of multi-drug resistant bacteria, including CRA, on a weekly basis. And if a patient is found positive, this patient is isolated, separated from other patients. Well, on that point, we will leave it. But a big, big thanks to all of our super panelists for our panel discussion, Dominique Monet, Ute Suingson, Barbara Freisham, and Ernesto Liabana, and of course, earlier to our keynote speakers as well. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful, valuable contributions. I think you've kicked off the European Antibiotics Awareness Day for 2021 very, very well. And of course, a huge thanks to those of you watching us online for contributing your very, very valuable input and um, questions and comments. So that's it for this particular panel session. And coming up now after this, there will be a number of parallel poster tours followed by several fireside sessions. So enjoy those and I will see you after lunch. <laughs>